What's going on guys? Good afternoon. We are still here on Wednesday and today I want to talk a little bit about plans for the future because right now we're feeling pretty good I think. We're 1-0 so we at least feel that good and there were some standout performances in that uh, game against the Denver Broncos and a lot of those standout performances come from the players that the Seahawks selected in the 2022 NFL Draft. So, I know it's early, and I know we have a lot more games to watch before we can make a full and truly measured conclusion here. But I want to start the conversation now. And really, this is a conversation that we've been having a little bit informally, informally excuse me, during the offseason. But I want to expand a little bit on that conversation now and have it in a little more of a direct form. So, quite simply, what should the Seattle Seahawks do with their 2022 draft class in the upcoming offseason? What should be the strategy, right? Because the Seattle Seahawks did very well in this draft. They got what looks like right now, and look, look, it's going to be early for all these guys. I don't want to get ahead of myself yet, but we look like we are headed in a very good direction with a franchise left tackle, a really good starting edge rusher, a, dare I say, elite running back, and an elite cornerback. Through two years in one game, that kind of feels like the direction that we're going in here. And I want to talk about those four guys specifically, because after a player's third year in the NFL, they become eligible for a contract extension. And rookie contracts in the NFL for draft picks run four years, so not every player is going to be able to immediately get that extension, right? Right. Like, Kobe Bryant is not going to be able to get an extension after this year because he hasn't done enough. He's not a bad player. He's done some nice things in the NFL so far. I, I don't mind having him around, but he's not a guy who's going to be able to say, hey, give me my extension after year three. Abe Lucas got off to a really good start in his career, but at this point, there's no way he's getting an extension no matter what happens. And then you have players like Tyreek Smith, who's already gone, and players like Bo Melton, who also is gone. So I'm not really talking about those guys. I'm talking about the four current studs. What would you do about them and their contracts in the upcoming offseason if and when they ask for money? So let's uh, refresh the conversation a little bit. Let's just start at the top. Charles Cross, who played brilliantly on Sunday, looks like he's starting to move towards becoming that true franchise left tackle. So, first of all, we need to understand where the market is when it comes to left tackles. Tristan Wirfs just reset the market at just over $28 million. So, the next big-time left tackle to get an extension might end up pushing to about $30 million. And that $30 million guy could very well be Charles Cross. However, there's a little bit of leverage right now with Charles Cross. The Seahawks have a little bit of leverage because... He's going to be finishing year three. He still has year four and the fifth year option. So let's go to Spotrack real quick. I don't like their layout, but I'm going to go ahead and use them for this video. In 2025, Charles Cross's cap hit would be $6.8 million. That would be a lot less than he would get on a new contract. So there's tremendous incentive for him to get long-term security past 2025. The 2026... Fifth year option, we don't know exactly what that's going to be yet. Over the cap has estimated it to be approximately 18.6 million, if you look at this table right here. However, if he makes the Pro Bowl this year, that number jumps all the way up to 22.9 million. So it goes up over 4 million. And <clears throat> I don't know if he's going to make the Pro Bowl or not. That's really tough to estimate. But if he plays the way he played in week one, he probably will. So. That's not really a desirable option for either side. The team doesn't really like that because it's so much money, if it is the 22.9, and the player doesn't like it because it's no long-term security. So Charles Cross is very motivated to get that extension done after this season, 
so much so he might be willing to take a little bit less because we're taking care of him, quote unquote, early. Now, what does that look like? What would that actually look like in practice? Andrew Thomas was in the same position a couple of years ago. He had finished his third season with the Giants. He had actually played probably a little bit better than Cross has so far, although he did also have injury issues that I think went a little beyond what Cross has had so far. And he got 23 and a half. So is it possible that you could dangle the threat of the fourth year at not even 7 million and then the fifth year option over Cross's head and get him to take like 25 million a year? What if you could get him on like five years, 125 million, four years, 100 million? Maybe it'd be a little bit more because that was two years ago and it's got to go up a little bit. And is that better than waiting a year and giving him 30 mil plus or two years and giving him 33 mil a year plus? My inclination would be you want to take care of Charles Cross this offseason, assuming he plays really well this year. If he plays at a Pro Bowl level, whether or not he makes it, I'm taking care of that contract this offseason. I'm going to try to get it done for somewhere around 25 to 26 million a year. Might have to push up to 27, but I know that if I wait another year, that's going to be 30 million. And if I wait a year after that, you're talking 32, 33. I'm getting it done now. I want my franchise left tackle if he looks like that at the end of this season. So that's number one. Number two, Boye Mafe. Boye Mafe, quiet first year in the NFL, of course, didn't do a lot, but was a decent part of a rotation. Last year broke out, had a nice year. This year, we'll see where it goes. He got off to a great start week one. But I firmly believe that Boye Mafe is headed towards stardom. Not super stardom. He's never going to be Miles Garrett or TJ Watt or any of those guys, or Nick Bosa, certainly. But I think he can go to that tier below, where he's not a guy who's ever going to get like 18 to 20 sacks, but he's a guy who can get 11 to 13 sacks. So I think he's headed towards a place where he's a borderline pro bowler, and if he has that kind of year in 2024, where he does get to like that, call it 12 sacks or so, you're going to quite possibly have him come to the table looking for money. And just to remind people, the edge market was crushed this offseason by Nick Bosa getting $34 million a year. Boye Mafe, on the fourth year of his deal, if he stays on it, would be getting about $2.7 million. So there would be incentive for him to give the team a break of course, because he's trying to get off of that fourth year. He does not want to come back and play a fourth year on $2.7 million. But where is the right slot here? Right? Is he as good as Nick Bosa? Of course not. Is he as valuable as uh, Josh Allen on Jacksonville? I don't think so. What about Brian Burns? He kind of had the Giants over a barrel, though, right? When they gave him 28.2, that, I don't know, I don't think that's quite the right comp here. Not yet. T.J. Watt signed his contract several years ago, and he got $28 million. Like, we're four years later. That's We're, we're kind of getting into realistic territory here, aren't we? Miles Garrett gets the $25 million in 2020? Like, I, I could see a scenario here, because I'm looking at some of these other guys who are below, guys like Montez Sweat getting 24 and a half, Danielle Hunter, and if Mafe has that big year this year where he does get to, like, 12 or even 13 sacks, isn't he going to be in the same sort of conversation is a guy like Danielle Hunter or Rashawn Gary or Bradley Chubb. So are we talking 25 mil a year? I kind of feel like the answer is yes. I kind of feel like that might be the floor. So Boye Mafe comes to you and says, I want four years, a hundred million. Same as Cross, basically, maybe slightly less than Cross. Maybe you break a deal because he's he wants to get off that fourth year on his rookie deal, and he'll give you a break because you're taking care of him early, maybe. But realistically, I I think it would be somewhere around there. Would I be willing to do it? I mean, I wouldn't love it, but I think I would because you can stagger it, the cap hits, so that Mafe's money kicks in right about the time you can move off of Nwosu. So that way, Mafe just kind of ascends to be your number one edge rusher when it's time to move off of Nwosu in a couple of years. 
So my in, my inclination right now is yes. It does kind of depend on what happens with Derek Hall this year. If he has a monster year, maybe you reconsider. Maybe you decide I'd rather keep Hall, or <clears throat> maybe you find a way to keep both. I, I don't know, but it makes it a little easier to not extend Mafe if Derek Hall breaks out, I guess. All right, so that's the second guy. Ken Walker the third. I feel like this one, it, it kind of sucks, but I feel like this one's also kind of a no-brainer. But let's talk about numbers real quick here. So Ken Walker, the running back um, position was reset. The market was reset with McCaffrey this offseason, 19 mil a year. And he kind of shattered a market that had been stagnant for a while. The biggest current running back contract that isn't McCaffrey is Alvin Kamara at 15. And that was signed in 2020. Jonathan Taylor got his deal a couple years ago at 14. If Ken Walker has a big year this year, if he breaks like 1,300 yards, which it looks like he probably can, I think he's passing Kamara. I think he's settling in at like $16 million a year. I think he's getting somewhere between Kamara and McCaffrey money, or at least that's what he's going to be looking for. Probably like, I'd say four years, $64 million. Now, he is currently looking down the barrel of a fourth year on his rookie deal that is only two point seven. There's tremendous incentive to avoid that. So maybe there's a way to avoid that, but that was the case for a lot of these players as well. I think Kamara got extended after three years, so did Taylor. And, you know, especially Kamara's case, that was a long time ago. So I'm looking at Ken Walker and I'm thinking like four years, 64 million is kind of a floor. I don't think he can do it. I think you got to say no to this one. It's a running back. He's already had a couple injuries in his career and... I, I just don't think you can justify it. Um, I, I It would be very rare for me to be willing to pay any running back. I don't think Ken Walker would allow me to break that rule. So for me, it's a no. Abe Lucas, unfortunately, can't be part of this conversation because he's injured and can't stay on the field. Kobe Bryant hasn't done enough. The last guy we're going to talk about in this video for this purpose is Reek Woolen. And this is another tough one. And... Um, this one's tougher for me for a very clear reason, I think, and it has very little to do with Woolen. Although, there are issues with him that make me wonder how much this team really wants to build around him long term. So, first thing to understand is that Woolen is the one guy on this list who's already made a Pro Bowl. So, even though he had a little bit of a quote-unquote down year last year, if he bounces back this year, I think he'll be totally fine at negotiations. The cornerback market, I mean, Patrick Sertan said it a little bit ago, and then Jalen Ramsey got a little adjustment so he could be the top guy again, which, I don't know, uh, that, that strikes me as kind of petty, but it's whatever. So let, let's look at Sertan as being the kind of market setter here because he was 24 when he got this, and it was $24 million a year. Um, Sauce is probably going to get extended next year as well, and he's probably going to end up with over 25 now, Reek Woolen isn't as good as somebody like a Pat Sertan. There are elements to Woolen's game that are not as well-rounded as what a guy like Sertan has. Now, I think he's better than Sauce, but I think Sauce is really overrated. So, in the general public perception of most people, Sauce Gardner is better as well. But if he has a big year this year, and that, that's really what the conversation we're having here, right? We're assuming these guys have big years. Woolen's going to be looking at a fourth year on his rookie deal of like 1.2 million. He's really going to want to get off that. I don't think he shows up next year playing for 1.2 million. I think he's like, I want my extension now or trade me. I'm not showing up for peanuts. So is he going to show up and ask for like 24 million a year? Seems realistic to me, right? If Sertan got the 24 million this year and the cap only goes up and Woolen comes off of another Pro Bowl caliber season where he maybe has like six or seven interceptions, maybe maybe even eight, and his tackling improves to where it's at least manageable, he might be the one asking for the 24, which would be a little bit under what Sauce probably gets, but I could absolutely see it. If he makes another Pro Bowl, he's got two Pro Bowls in three years. He's got a lot of ammunition to bring into that negotiation room. And the reality is, we are at that point one year away from having to pay Devin Witherspoon. So I am actually, I mean, I'm not a no on it in the sense that I wouldn't like it. Of course, I would like it if he had a great year and we extended him. But 
I would personally predict that the team can't do it because they can't pay two cornerbacks top of the market money. Like the the uh, early Legion of Boom Seahawks paid a lot of players on defense, right? They paid Cam, they paid Earl, they played Sherman, paid Wagner. To a certain extent, they played Bennett and Averill, even though they never made top of the market money at edge. They made a lot of money. And look at what they had to do to do that. They had to field the cheapest, youngest, and in some cases, among the worst offensive lines in the NFL. So that's what you have to give up in order to pay your defenders like that. And by the way, the Seahawks, to my recollection, never paid two cornerbacks top of the market money, right? Sherman got top of the market money, but the guy across from him would would have been... What, Brandon Browner? Brandon Browner wasn't on a big deal until he left. Byron Maxwell wasn't on a big deal until he left. The other cornerback spots on the team when we had Sherman tended to be rotated in and out on who we had, who was cheap, who we could get who was cheap. So I don't think Woolen's going to be back after this season. I actually think that when you do the math, my bold prediction would be that Reek Woolen gets traded this upcoming offseason because he won't show up for $1.2 million on the fourth year, and we won't want to extend him because our plan will be to extend Witherspoon. And Witherspoon's just a better all-around player. He, he just is. He brings more to the table. It's something that Mike McDonald is probably looking at, is thinking, I can use this for the next decade plus because of his skill set. And Woolen is somebody who won't really be replaceable, and it really sucks to lose him after only three years, but... You want to get something for him rather than get involved in an ugly holdout that, by the way, Woolen would have every right to to uh, hold out in that circumstance. If he only has, if he has two Pro Bowl years and he can get a new contract and we can't give it to him, he has every right to be like, hey, this is not right. What if I tear my Achilles next year? Am I really going to give you all this high quality play and then not never get paid? Am I going to leave that up as a possibility? No. So I would have no issue with it, but I kind of feel like that's where this is headed. So that's how I would handle things. I would extend Charles Cross this offseason immediately if he keeps this up. Mafe, I think I would extend. I would be a little bit more open to letting that ride in year four if he is, but I would probably try to take care of it. I would let Ken Walker play out the fourth year and then figure out what to do the next offseason, probably let him walk. And then Woolen... I would not extend, look to trade if he decides to hold out, and if he doesn't hold out, then great, maybe we can tag and trade him the next year, but I don't think I can give him the extension. All right, see you guys later. Go Hawks. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you would do.